What's up guys, my name is Sammy Forsen, host of the Weekend City Show and Ignition right here on Joy 99.7 FM. Well, anytime you happen to be busy and you miss out on your favorite shows right here on Joy FM, here's what you can do. Log on to myjoyonline.com forward slash podcast. Just go on there and you'll find all your shows on demand 24-7. There you can catch up. Remember, Joy FM remains your radio for discerning listeners. Seven. Let's start now with our very first story and seven heads of state from the economic community of West African states are to determine the fate of Guinea in an extraordinary summit called uh, by the chairman of the regional bloc, President Eko Fuado in Accra today. Military Colonel Mamadi Dumbuya took over power early this month, accusing the deposed president Alpha Conde of economic mismanagement. Now, today's meeting is expected to take a tough stand on the situation and agree on a roadmap to returning Guinea back to constitutional rule. Here is President Ekofuado as he opened that session. The United Nations, the African Union, and several other con countries outside the continent have also condemned the coup. In discussing this issue during our virtual conference, of 8 September 2021, we reiterated our condemnation, suspended Guinea forthwith from membership of our organization, and decided to establish immediately to Guinea a high-level ECOWAS mission, composed of the chairperson of the Council of States, the Ghanaian Foreign Minister, the Honorable Shelly Ayoko Butre, the President of the ECOWAS Commission, His Excellency Jean-Claude Brou, the Foreign Minister of Burkina Faso, the Honorable Alpha Bari, and the Foreign Minister of Togo, the Honorable Robert Duse, to assess the situation in that country and report back to us. The delegation went to Guinea on Friday the 10th of September, met the military leaders, and saw President Alpha Conde in his place of detention. They have made a report to us, which will be the basis of our deliberations at this emergency summit on Guinea. We will receive also a report from the mediator of the Malian crisis, His Excellency Goodluck Jonathan, the former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, on developments in Mali. We are required to take informed decisions on these matters that will have long-term consequences for the stability and the defense of the democratic values of our region. I count on you, Excellencies, to help proffer durable solutions to the crisis. And I'm confident that as in the past, we will rise to the occasion. I wish us fruitful deliberations, and I thank you for your attention and declare this opening ceremony closed. We shall return to that situation and the extraordinary summit that is being held uh, there. But for now, two teachers have been arrested at the Ahamanso Islamic Senior High School for attempting to leak Monday's English language paper to in the ongoing WASI. The arrest was triggered by external supervisors from the West African Examinations Council, who are said to have spotted and invigilated 33 year old Musa Muhammad, who was taking pictures of the examination question paper with his phone. Correspondent Peter Senu has been giving further details on this arrest. Uh, they were taking pictures of the last Monday's English um, paper, paper 2, uh, specifically, to be sent out for uh, the, uh, another teacher who is an English language teacher to help the students within. But as we speak, the the one who committed the crime, Musa um, Mohammed, he has been sentenced to 65 penalty units. Uh, my check revealed that it is about um, 780 Ghana cities. Uh, that, that is uh, when you convert the penalty unit. But um, the Felix Oklu who sent him to take the pictures for me, he is the English teacher who sent him to take the pictures for him. He has denied any knowledge of of, of um, Musa Mohammed's action, and so he is to reappear on the 11th of October, that's next month, before the KDB uh, Magistrate Court. And so that is what we know um, has happened.
So apart from the teacher, the 33-year-old who has been nabbed, the other one is claiming innocence, uh, just to clarify. Exactly so. That is what he claimed. He said before the court yesterday. Where exactly are they at the moment? Well, I, I'm sure that the one who was sentenced would have met his um, sentencing uh, requirement and would have been um, maybe home by now. But the other is on police inquiry bail, and so I'm sure he's also... I mean, yeah, so from the court, he's supposed to provide two sureties as part of his bail requirement, one of whom should be on uh, should be a controller and accountant general um, payroll. And so I'm sure that he would have met the requirement as we left the court yesterday. So currently, maybe on police inquiry bill, uh, Benjamin. We've heard Wyek respond to some of these alleged leakages and other matters arising. How has the school itself been reacting? What have they said? Well, the headmaster himself was in court yesterday, and the magistrate was not happy with his approach to, so to say, um, supervising his subordinates to, to, to ask it where ensure that children do not copy, let alone teachers trying to take pictures or attempting to help students in the exam room. And so, well, the school, the headmaster has been defending his position as the, as the only um, supervisor because he said, according to WAEC, the students are less than 250, and so he could be the only supervisor. And so he said he went out to take his nose mask uh, when the incident happened, and so he has been defending his position, but the court wouldn't accept that. And so he... The court, I don't know what they will be doing to him, but he, he, he's been told that he's negligent on duty uh, from the courtroom uh, yesterday. But the school, everybody is tied lived on, on what is happening, except the two that have been put before court, and then the headmaster making some comments in the courtroom yesterday. But... Well, on the back of that, Africa Education Watch has petitioned the CID to investigate the circumstances leading to the leakages reported so far. Kofi Asari is executive director. If, why, that if questions leak 30 minutes or 45, 45 minutes to the scheduled time for examination, it may be deemed not to be widespread if they have a means to, to, to verify what is widespread mm -hmm. in an era of social media. But this is the case where we intercepted these questions the previous night. Okay. Okay. And we have evidence. And indeed, we have shown some of the evidence, a result of elective mathematics to work on the platform that we intercepted it. We went there with a the live platform and showed it to them that as before midnight, around 11 o'clock, okay. these questions were already in circulation. Mm. We, we got the first question at 4 a.m. Okay. And then we had the management one yesterday. At what's your source? The questions are sold. So we also buy them. Oh, really? They are sold. From who? So if you know the people who you are buying from, yes. why are you not uh, pinning them out that so that why, they can be arrested or that, sanctioned? That is why I'm saying that I just left the CID headquarters. Okay. We've been in discussions with the CID since yesterday. Mm. Because we have been monitoring the WASI and the activities of question marketers mm. and people who have been doing the business on the ground. Okay for over two months now. Mm. One month before it was started. You understand? But the issue is that when you package the evidence and you take it to Wayek, Wayek will say the question circulated minutes before the examination. Okay. When we got the questions, where people are actually buying the questions on platforms with over 100,000 subscribers on, mm. 10 hours before. Mm. Okay. So we have, we, have, we, have, we have given all the evidence we have. The, to the CID that mm. it should investigate. Mm. And then our interest is that we want to ensure that the people within YX system, who some bad elements, okay, who are taking advantage of their positions in the system, especially between the depots and the schools, mm. are dealt with, whether it's from YX, whether it's from the NES. But they are the two people who normally handle the questions. Well, from another end, ranking member of Parliament's Education Committee, Peter Nochukoto, says government is working to nip the practice in the bud. Actually, I was surprised because uh, work had given every indication and assurance that uh, they were going to make sure that uh, there will be no leakages uh, this year. The leakages come about as a result of a human interference or human interference. No, they deal with uh, people uh, who handle uh, the questions, the question papers, the printing, and all those things. So they, 
uh, gave us assurances and indication that uh, they were going to make sure that uh, the human interference or interface uh, was uh, safeguarded, that those who will handle the papers will be people who will, uh, they will make sure that uh, they did not or nobody had access to the questions. Then we advise that uh, whenever uh, they were able to identify the culprits, that is, those who leaked the papers, they should punish them, make their names public, and the punishment given to them. And last year, we expected that uh, they would have done that. They have not done so. So if you don't name and shame, that means whatever is happening, you are not uh, making the effort to eliminate them. You don't handle the issue administratively. Okay. You can hand, it, hand them over to the police to prosecute and any other thing that uh, will be meted out to them. But if they continue to keep the names uh, to themselves, the punishment, uh, they meted out to the people to themselves, this will continue. It will not deter uh, others from uh, doing the same. That is a ranking member on the Education Committee there. Now, armed police personnel have been deployed to the KNUSD campus after the Ashanti Regional Security Council served notice of an intelligence it had picked on a planned disturbance by two rival halls of the university. Authorities are taking measures to avert a repeat of a similar incident in 2018 that culminated in the destruction of university property in excess of 3 million Ghana cities. The Regional Security Council subsequently declared the KNUSD campus a security zone. My colleague Oheming Teria joins us live with uh, more. Now, Oheming, the situation has come to the fore now. What is the latest you can report on the back of this uh, latest or these latest skirmishes? Uh, thank you, my brother. What we do know, according to the university authorities, mm. there's a planned a clash uh, between the supporters of two uh, university halls. Uh, the halls are Unity and then University Hall, also known as Katanga. Mm -hmm. Also known as Katanga. And uh, we are told uh, this incident was actually triggered by an earlier incident about uh, two weeks ago uh, where students from University uh, Unity Hall are said uh, to have gone to uh, Katanga Hall mm -hmm. and there's a statue in front of Katanga Hall. That is where they wanted to wear their jacket. Uh, so this infuriated uh, some supporters from Katanga Hall. And uh, because of this incident, the university authorities say the students are planning uh, to vent their spleen on each other. Immediately they are done with the Friday uh, end of semester exams. And this is what has occasioned the heavy security presence on campus. Uh, according to the university authorities, uh, there, there are police and there are also national security and BNI uh, officers uh, who are on campus. Uh, they are being supported by the university's own security uh, operation. Uh, so uh, on the campus here, it appears a normal day uh, for students who are busily going about uh, writing their end of uh, semester exams. According to the university relations officer, Dr. Norris Bequin, uh, the, the arrangements have been put in place, and this arrangement is the fact that those uh, foreign students and those who, are also, who also have uh, projects uh, to defend will have the opportunity to stay on campus even after Friday, but they have to apply for permission from university authorities mm. before they will be allowed And that is my colleague, uh, Hoi Hibing Teria there, who was just telling us about the current situation between those two halls uh, on the back of happenings some two weeks ago. And, of course, now uh, the university authorities having to step in together with the police. Hoi Hibing Teria, so uh, you were making a point. I would have you wrap up on that point. And maybe you can share with us as you do so what exactly the feeling is on campus with the students and how they are reacting to uh, the police presence and all of that. Yes, uh, for uh, students of KNUSC, it's a normal day for them as they go about uh, writing their end of uh, semester exams. Right. Uh, but the security presence is very visible on campus. Uh, the university authorities say uh, they deployed some of the officers to the uh, halls of residence of students. 
mm. uh, to protect life and property. They wouldn't want a reoccurrence of what happened in 2018, where uh, thousands of properties were destroyed uh, on campus. But I spoke to the SRC of what they make of the happenings here on campus, and the vice uh, president, uh, Morris uh, Ifa, uh, told me, uh, for the SRC, they are okay with the arrangements uh, being put in place by university authorities uh, because they don't have the knowledge uh, to take this into. So they will right. support whatever arrangements that the authorities have put in place. And beyond this, they haven't also received any complaints from students uh, complaining about uh, the presence of the security on campus. And he, as he put it, uh, they've been living with the security uh, operating since the 2018 when uh, the students uh, clash on campus. Uh, so for the SRC, they are okay with the arrangement and then will support this. But they are waiting uh, to hear from students what they make of what is happening. In between uh, this and that arrangement, they haven't received any complaints from students indicating uh, their uneasiness or not being happy with what is happening on campus here. Well, that is my colleague, Oheming Teria, who is with uh, Inshira FM, and he's been giving us the latest as far as that development is concerned. On now to our very next story, and the Catholic Bishops' Conference in the Jassican Diocese of the OT region has instituted a committee to ensure that child rights are protected and incidents of child labor are reduced in the diocese. According to the church, it is within its responsibility to shepherd the child from exploitation. Peter Senu has more in the following report. The church, as part of its corporate social responsibility, has set up a committee which mandate is to ensure the protection of child rights and eliminate any existing form of child labor and abuse. The church has engaged parents and other stakeholders from fishing and farming communities in the Jassican Diocese, which covers almost the entire Oti region, on taking steps to reducing incidents of child labor and abuse. Speaking at the ceremony, the regional director for social welfare, Innocent Agbalusu, explained the position of the law on parental responsibility to children. He also mentioned some circumstances that can put children at risk of labor and abuse, adding all must emulate this act by the church. Parental duty and responsibility. Some of us just give birth to the children, then we leave them to take care of themselves. It is a common practice to see a man marrying about four or five wives, and then every woman is left to take care of her child. Worst of all, you see some of these children taking care of themselves. So even during school hours, they are busy. They are weaving baskets, they are doing things that will make them generate money to pay their own school fees. The law is saying that everybody who has a child has the responsibility to take care of him or her. Other churches and religious sects, the Muslim, even the traditionalists, I think that they must emulate this within their fold in order to protect children who are God's gifts to us. According to the chief fisherman, Daniel Vaje, from Tapabutuasi, which is one of the fishing communities along the Volta Lake, though the number of child labor on the lake is reducing, the punishment regime for those who traffic and abuse children on the lake is not a deterrent enough. This uh, international justice mission, when they are there arresting the people on the lake, they now come down there, this is the attention of the child labor on the Volta Lake. Yes, yes, when they, these people go around, and arresting the people. They didn't give them any punishment. So they think it's something they can continue doing. Because when they have been, they have been punishing them, it will stop drastically. He also alleges the absence of any education infrastructure on the islands can be blamed for the abuse of children on the lake. The overbound communities, you know, in a school there. And they will see these politicians who come there. Oh, today we will next year we will come and do this. Next year we will come and do this. Next year we will come and do this. Fortunately, you will not see them again. Until the four years, four years they will come back. Cocoa Board in the Jessican district also admits there are incidents of child labor on the various cocoa farms, but reduced to the barest minimum as they encourage women participation in cocoa farming. On a scale of 1 to 10, I say in our cocoa farms, uh, we have reduced it to uh, about 2. 
that's even to the west and we have engaged a lot of cocoa farmers in programs that empower them and to let them know the consequences of child labor reverend father pius biamse speaks for the diocese according to him this is just one of the social interventions from the church aimed at raising responsible adults it is our own future so if our children are not, not doing very well now uh, then how will our, will our future uh, future be and uh, as uh, we can see the school dropouts the number of girls the the number of uh, students in the ghs the number is dwindling so this we, we need to we need to do something he added the church is also concerned about the recent crimes and murders involving children hence the need to guide and secure them for the future the recent killing like uh, what happened in kasua uh, adolescents killed their own kind and we know that our children are also exposed to these things, uh, the mentality of uh, being rich quickly and um, social network and uh, the internet. They are learning a lot and mostly what they learn is bad. So the, the, we are concerned about the behavior of uh, many, some, some bad children in the country now. Peter Senu for Joy News. <laughs> Let's now talk about displaced yam traders at the Kumasi Central Market who have had to spend the night at the racecourse market to secure space in which to trade. The group is contesting the space allocation with dealers and second-hand clothing. Now, city authorities have been accused of poor relocation plans resulting in the confusion. My colleague Mona Lisa Frimpong of Love FM joins us live with more. Now, Mona Lisa, what is the current situation at the KJTR market as we speak? We've heard of the two factions clashing over space. What exactly is the current situation? Mona Lisa, so if you can hear me, I am asking what the current situation is at uh, the KJTR market as we speak. Okay, so uh, Mr. Bassi, the Honorable is saying that he the market, and he said he has designated a place for um, one of the traders to move to. But the second hand sellers are talking to and the young sellers also that we talked to you in the morning say they are not ready all right mona lisa i'm going to have to interject and ask you to do this we can barely uh, hear you i can barely hear you so maybe if you could move away from where all that noise is we'd be grateful so we can get details of what you're saying. But so far, I gather that you've been saying the two groups are not willing to. Uh... Hello? Hello? Yes, Mona Lisa, so I can hear you now. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. So, um, the Lisa says that he and the boss was here this afternoon, and he says he's admitted a place for one of the traders to move to. And then the second-hand sales seller is to, as well as the young traders they say none of them are ready to leave this place for the other to trade. And uh, the second-hand clothes dealers say they will storm here with their wares tomorrow and force the young traders, the successful sellers and sellers here, to leave this place. And yesterday, um, the young um, traders were allowed that uh, the police where they saw some second-hand clothes dealers, I mean, new holding catalysis and six ready to uh, assault some of We shall reconnect with uh, Monisa Frimpong as and when the connection is better so we can hear exactly what she is saying. But the Bono Regional Minister says the growing unemployment situation the youth is grappling with could be dealt with through entrepreneurship and educational reforms. Justina Ousu Banahine insists a mandatory entrepreneurship experience for the youth and educational reform that emphasize on technical vocational educational training would make the youth employable. The minister was speaking in Sunyani at the inauguration 
of the Bono Regional Youth Parliament on the motion, Young People Entering into Employment in Ghana, the Barriers and Solutions from the Youth Perspective. Precious Semevo has more. The Youth Parliament is an initiative enshrined in the 2010 National Youth Policy of the National Youth Authority. It is aimed at giving the youth a platform to learn how to express their views, offer constructive criticisms, and above all, participate effectively in the decision-making process on developmental issues at the local level. At the inauguration of the Bono Regional Youth Parliament in Sunyane, the Regional Director of the National Youth Authority, Fatih Bamba, called on the youth to make good use of the non-partisan platform. The importance of the youth parliament is to engage the youth in decision making and governance, basically, so that we can call duty bearers to answer to questions that need redress. Because we've realized that there are a whole lot of things in communities and in the region that most of the young people are not informed. They are not aware of what is going on. So with the youth parliament concept, it will help them to really get to know what is going on in their uh, communities, in their region. Then they can equally inform uh, the layman or their peers so that it wouldn't create any confusion in the system. Effective and better communication helps for everybody to have peace of mind in their communities. And this is something that we want to integrate beyond the Bono region. We want to do that of Ahafo and uh, Bono East region. Speaking on the motion, young people entering into employment in Ghana, the barriers and solutions from the youth perspective, the Bono regional minister, Justin Ausu Banahene, said an entrepreneurship experience and a reform that gives priority to technical vocational education training would make the youth employable. A mismatch of skills has been found to contribute to the rising youth unemployment. I must say, Mr. Speaker, one of the surest ways of dealing with youth unemployment phenomenon is through entrepreneurship, that's a mandatory experience, educational reforms with emphasis on technical, vocational, and skill training to make the youth employable. Many of our young people in our tertiary institutions have great business ideas, and if provided with the right nurturing and Sensitization, they could easily get set up their own businesses after school and succeed. I want to tell society that today in our world, looking at our environment with the raw materials that surrounds us, if we are able to enhance on TV vocation, on TV skill ability, we will be able to employ ourselves. The speaker, Kinsley Asari Abwaje, and the youth parliament leadership spoke to join you. So, from the deliberation today, we realized that it is not the issue of the government alone. But we, the youth in particular, should also mine our business up. One of the contributing factors could be related to uh, job hopping. Our curriculums, they will make moderations in them by adding skills, entrepreneurship skills to it. Precious Semevo, Joy News, Sunya. Just so live on Joy News today, there's a lot more coming your way. We take a break now. When we return, we bring you business. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The Ministry of Food and Agriculture is rolling out a technology to reduce rejection of Ghana's food export commodities on the EU market. Known as the e-traceability system, it will support product quality improvement for goods ready for export to enhance market entry. The mechanism feeds into Ghana's 10-year national export development strategy to increase our non-traditional export revenue to $25 billion by the year 2029. Prince Apia was at a sensitization workshop in Kumase and has more. After the European Union banned some fruits and vegetables from Ghana from entering its market, the Food and Agriculture Ministry started manual inspection of goods before exports. Though effective, it had some gaps that needed to be filled. The new electronic tracking system being introduced is expected to replace the manual system to ensure that flagged products are chased to the exact farm. Director Project at Ghana Export and Promotions, Alexander uh, Dajawa, says this will be fully implemented by end of 2023. And concerns have been raised severally about um, uh, quality of products that are consumed. You know these days people are very careful about their health. 
Um, and so they are careful that everything that is imported into their country is able to meet their market requirements. Traceability simply means that when something is exported and it goes out to another country and there's a challenge to that particular product, it must be traced back to the origin or where it comes from. And that gives assurance and protection to the consumers in the markets to believe that when they consume products from anywhere in the world, they are safe. And even if something happens, we are able to trace it back and take corrective measures. And so this has become an imperative uh, in all markets. The e-traceability technology focuses its efforts on Ghanaian shea and coconut-based cosmetic products, cassava, mango and pineapples. Mr. Dajawa says the objective is for Ghana to achieve increased export revenue. The target is that we should reach all producers, processes uh, countrywide in Ghana, so that it doesn't matter where the product is coming from, from the remotest area of Ghana. Once it is going to be part of the product that will be exported out of Ghana, it must come under the traceability system. Because it's all about market entry. If you are not able to send your products into the market, certainly you will not be able to get the revenue. And the assurance that the market gets from us showing that we are able to put the system in place we open more doors for us to uh, ensure that we export more. The Plant Protection and Regulatory Services has already conducted mapping exercise on the selected value chains in the various regions. Now, a Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry report shows that less than 10% of SMEs maximize digital marketing tools. Here's more. A lot has changed quickly within the past couple of years, especially coming off the back of COVID-19 and the emergence of the Continental Free Trade Agreement area. On global search websites, people can make about 5.6 billion searches each day. As of January this year, there were about 15.7 million internet users, 8.2 million social media users in Ghana alone. According to the Ghana Chamber of Commerce and Industry, entrepreneurs can make the best out of this by expanding their customer clientele to millions of customers within an hour. Business has changed. Okay, today you can't do without digital marketing. Okay, and the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement is here. And it is important to prepare the Ghanaian business. As much as it's an opportunity, it is also a threat. Because now, how will a small business will be able to cover all these countries, you know, if they don't have the digital infrastructure to enable them to go global and uh, to fit in the new digital age. Speaking to Joy Business at a two-day digital marketing workshop and clinic, the head of growth strategy for Paragon Digital Marketing, Kwabuna Epienim, explained the need for small enterprises to be resilient in the digital space to attract more investment. Almost everyone that we are targeting now is online. Everyone is using a smartphone, watching a YouTube video or on Facebook. So we should change our mindset on how we want to reach them and leverage on what we have now. Marketing on Facebook is literally free. Marketing on YouTube is literally free. All we have to do is to create a lot of content so that we can reach these people, get them to consume it, change what they think about so we can sell our products to them. The two-day digital marketing workshop and clinic is part of efforts by the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry to boost the capacity of small enterprises and make them competitive in the continental free trade agreement area. And that's business for now. More coming up at the top of the hour. Meantime, there's more news on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Sports is up next. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the sports segment with me, Ray Kuwampofo. It's a big day in Ghana football as we await the announcement of the head coach of the Black Stars, that's the new announcement. I remember the you know, three-member committee did put out that 72 hours would be the time that they require to find Sika Connors replacement. And the time is ticking as by 5.45, that would be exactly 72 hours. As we do wait, Joy Sports can exclusively confirm that uh, you know, um, Milorayevac is the front runner for the job. And sports journalist Kautofo believes that it would be too risky uh, for the Ghana Football Association to re-elect 
the former Serbian coach who once led Ghana to a World Cup quarterfinal. For fraternity, that you never go back to a place where you have had so much success. Of course, the pendulum has been raised to a certain level. Okay. Anything below that means that you're in trouble. So if you take a look at it, millions of coaches around the world over the past 60, 70 years do not make it a habit of going back. One or two have done, and it has turned out very bad. Okay. So there's that record there. So mm. one, I'll be highly surprised if Ryback, who is a European, will come back and accept to come back. And two, I want to know what sort of figures he's quoting now. Okay. And that would really be my mind. But at the end of the day, let's spell it out clearly. Whoever they choose may not necessarily be the one. Because at the end of the day, it's the government of Ghana, the people of Ghana, who are going to pay. And so if there is a, some belief that the payer wants somebody of a particular ilk, then all they can do is that the FA can find the person, it's Zaya Yebo, and they put it before the Minister of Sports, who puts it before Cabinet, and Cabinet says, we can't pay that, case closed. Some more stories where the Ghana Swimming Association has inaugurated an 11-member committee to oversee the successful hosting of the 14th Ghana African Seniors and Junior Swimming and OP Water Championship at the Bukum International Pool in Accra. The local organizing committee is confident of getting the job done. My colleague Haruna Mubarak was there and filed this report. I will uphold, uphold, preserve, preserve protect, protect, and defend the Constitution of Ghana and, the and integrity of the National Force Authority. So help me, God. Thank you so much. So the job has officially been accepted and the 11 members making up the local organizing committee are mandated to ensure the event becomes successful. Director General of the National Sports Authority, Professor Chumesi, pledged support for the newly formed LOC and charged them to deliver. We we'll benefit from it. On that note, I want to commend you and congratulate you uh, for coming up with this particular competition, the hosting right that you have secured. We will support you, and I encourage members of the LOC also to be able to do their best to give us the best of competitions on the continent. Ghana won the bid to host the 14th African Championship following the successful host of the Ghana Zone 2 Championship in March 2020 at the Bukom International Pool. President of the Ghana Swimming Association, Delphine Kwe, admits they have a real job on their hands. But this year, you see, it's bigger than what we did last year. Last year was just Zone 2. This year is the whole of Africa. This is Ghana. And we are hoping that we will do better, far better, because we are hosting so many people than we did last year. So we need the help of the media. We need the help of everybody to help us organize this competition successfully. Speaking on behalf of the 11-member LOC committee, Saha Kambolamte acknowledged that they relish the opportunity and believe they have the competence required for the task. Obviously, we are confident. I mean, you could tell the people on the team are all people that have accomplished um, one or two things in their own right. So definitely um, the Ministry of Sports, the National Sports Authority, the Ghana Swimming Association saw something in each and every member of this LOC and have nominated us to be the committee that would deliver this competition and we definitely are going to deliver. The 14th Ghana African Seniors and Junior Swimming and Open Water Championship will be held from the 11th to the 17th of October this year. Well, that's how we wrap up the sports here. You can get some more sports stories on my journal online for us last sports. And that's the big story uh, that has to do with Milivan Raivat. He's set to be appointed 
again as Black Stars coach. But once the news is confirmed, we'll be here to bring you all the analysis and uh, you know the backstories to the appointment of Milovan Raivaj. My name is Ori Guampofo and that's the sports for now.